All right. Hello, everyone. How are we all? I'll just check the discussion uh, sounds working. Yep, yep. Cool. All right. Cool. So welcome. My name is Christy. I work at Salsa. Um, I'm a community manager and I'm also the track chair for this year's Drupal Gov and I'll be moderating the panel today. And today we're going to be talking about content creation, management and the overlap with user experience. Um, I think about this in a couple of ways. It's the understanding of the right content for a site build and how that is best structured how to then upload that content into a site with useful workflows and a great UX. Um, but this is an open panel, so if you've got any um, things to share or any questions or um, tips uh, that uh, people in our field are doing, please uh, do let us know in the discussion forum. Um, we'll hopefully be able to do some Q&A, but 20 minutes goes pretty quick, so we'll see how we go. Um, I'll ask that only one person speaks at a time, and I'll just um, round robin and ask you questions as we go. Cool. So with me, we've got Matt Fenwick. So Matt is the content lead at Oxide Interactive and specializes in grounding content for both user needs and business requirements. We've got Angus, and he's the lead content strategist at Weave and is also the organizer of the Canberra Content Strategy Meetup and an official trainer of Content Design London. And then we've got Eddie. Um, who works at Sparks Interactive and is interested in accessibility, usability, and auditing tools for content. Uh, so thank you all three for joining this, and thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, I thought we could discuss a few things today. Content strategy, creating great content structures, content governance, the UX for uploading well-designed content in the back end, and how we can help clients at each of these stages. So Angus, I'd like to start with you, please. Uh, would you like to talk about content strategy as an early step in the process of a site refresh or site build? Sure. Yep. So, so at its simplest, I guess most people have heard have heard of content strategy, and it uh, encompasses a lot of different things. Uh, but at its simplest, it's really about as an organisation reaching a shared understanding of what your content is for. Like, why do you even have content? Uh, and one of the most you know, one of the most common problems we see when we go into organisations is, um, you know, there's too much content, it's a mess, uh, nobody can find it, uh, um, content just gets published kind of when somebody requests it without any particular, particular sort of governance over that. Um, and what that really comes down to is that organisations don't have that, that really strong shared understanding of, you know, first of all, who their users are, who they're writing content for, and what are the problems that they're trying to solve for those users. So reaching that shared understanding early in a project really then um, means that you can create kind of content structures, whether that's an information architecture or a content model um, that are focused on answering user needs rather than just um, wrangling the kind of the content that the organization already ha already has. And, uh, Angus, what methods do you use in the early stages of the project to, to get that from clients? Uh, well, you, well, we always start with research. Um, so it depends on the budget of the project, how much research we can do and what forms. Um, we'll certainly run run sort of internal you know, workshops with stakeholders or we'll do interview in individual interviews with stakeholders um, some of the time. We look at existing things like analytics um, and that kind of thing to see what's been working and what hasn't been working on the current site. But you know, I think most importantly, we'll make every effort to talk to real users um, and to delve into you know, what are the kind of problems that they're having, um, what are the kinds of needs that they have that, this, that the organisation should, should, be, uh, should be solving. Cool. So I'm just checking the discussion form if there's any questions. Um, it doesn't seem to be. I'll just check the live to me. Um, Matt, I know you wanted to talk about educating clients about content modeling. Do you want to uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, cool. So following on from what Angus was saying, you know, once you've got the basic content intent um, defined, then it's about translating that into the I guess the guts of the content um, and what we tend to see, I'm um, certainly working a lot with, with government and 
working with um, or, or seeing work coming out of some digital agencies is is that there tends to be a bit of a, a heavy focus on the visual design and not as much emphasis on the the structure of the content. Um, and so you've you've got the information architecture which. Um, governs, you know, the site map, but a lot of the time uh, people will stop there and then the content itself, what happens when you get to the page is just this vast undifferentiated blob, you know. Um, so we, we talk about container projects where um, uh, agencies or, or get paid to deliver containers. So things that the client can fill with sort of whatever content they like. And that presents problems for the user experience because it's at the level of content that people are actually going to be able to get something done, um, you know, complete a task, apply for a benefit. So content modeling is essentially the, the practice of working out what content do we have, what do we need, and how should that content be structured? And mm -hmm. if you've got uh, an analytical brain, then um, You'll, you'll love content modeling because it's very much about pulling content apart and putting it back together again in a, in a structure that's, I think the key thing is consistency here. So you can define a content type and then like say a, um, let's say a bio page, and then you're really iterating on that, on that type every time you create um, a, new, uh, a new instance of that type. And I think, you know, it does curtail clients' creative impulses where they want to go rogue and, you know, write whatever. But I think one way of selling them on this is by showing them examples from other organisations where the content's clearly inconsistent and then just saying, you know, how does that affect you when you see that? So, you know, getting them to think beyond just, I want to be random to, you know, how can uh, or what's the actual impact on the user? Um, I'm happy to talk more about some techniques if there's time. I think this is to question the live Q&A. Um, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't see it. Do you mind reading it? Yes, so there was a question here from Max. How important is hierarchy, hierarchy wow, I can't even say that word. I'm so sorry. Uh, a document outline. For hierarchy. You. Hierarchy. Yeah, hierarchy. So maybe me say something. <laughs> We're just going to move right after that. So. so document hierarchy. Um, so, I mean, content modeling is all about defining the relationships between the parts, but hierarchy is only one relationship. So, you know, you, you could think about hierarchy as like, you know, um, you've got your, your heading and then your subheadings and so on. That's a hierarchical relationship. But it's also helpful to think about associative relationships. So as an example, um, anytime you read a book on content modeling, they always talk about like music or albums for some reason. So an album is an album is going to have an artist um, and an album is also going to have tracks. So each of those things could be discrete content components that are going to have a relationship. So I'd say to the question, uh, depends what you're trying to do and if a hierarchy um, matches the user's mental model, but I'd generally be encouraging people to think about associative relationships or navigation as well. Like what's the thing that people are likely to want to read next after they've read this? Cool. Uh, so Eddie, you raised a number of topics in our notes uh, about how can we design building block content types for common functionality, including form displays, view modes, and taxonomies and also the importance of common terminology and approaches across sites. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I could talk for a few hours on that, but uh, we'll keep it short. There's a lot of things in that. And I think uh, talking on what the other speakers here have talked about, it's just about, you know, defining some of those formats and structures of your content early, early on. And um, what we do with Sector with our distribution um, across all of our sites, we have sort of common content types, you know, one that's always for news articles, one that's always for resources, one that's for, for events, etc. And um, showing, as someone said before, showing uh, examples of how their content might fit into an existing well-tested um, structure um, that works for other clients is, is really a, 
a good way to um, to get them on board. And Alexander O'Hare was talking about, um, and the question's talking about content I think is really good. Um, there's, there's lots of ways of doing that and showing examples of where it's working is, is important. Um, with those structured um, content types also becomes the underlying structure and talked about the detail. You know, a lot of this comes down to the detail of looking at what are the types of uh, content they're putting in there, if it's dates and times, uh, those sorts of ones. And what we've been really keen on is trying to make those consistent so that even between websites, they're all based upon our distribution. Um, an event type is very similar from one website to another. It will have its differences for, for each requirement, but having those same field names and same view modes uh, for like a, a preview or a teaser and for the default page or for a, um, a social media share or something like that really helps to have uh, that consistency and that confidence in what you're presenting to someone works. So. Uh, thinking about what's been done before and why it's been done, it's always that why question is good. Those sorts of uh, approaches, that common stuff means that people even within your development team can have a consistent language and that that can be con conveyed to your audience or to your clients in a way you can reuse uh, documentation, you can reuse testing scripts, all those sorts of things. So. Um, don't think about it in the short term, think about it in the long term and also in the exportability or the maintainability of your site and your client's content. Um, it's great for exporting down the track if you've always got something called last underscore updated for your updated date. You know, it's not date changed or something like that. If it's, uh, so just really thinking about what are the basic uh, fields and structure that your data goes into and and you can show the client. And when you've got someone working for one or two clients, it's probably going to work for the third, fourth, and fifth clients as well because it's tested through. So, um, you know, lessons learned and work on where you've gone from. Don't reinvent the wheel every time. Um, I've got a, a, a question here as well. Do you think as Drupal professionals, we lack a standard way of implementing bread and butter IA and what might happen to prevent endless bad sites? Who wants to answer this one? You all seem very keen. Yeah. <laughs> Drupal. I think one one of the issues with with so w w one of the great things about Drupal is its its flexibility and the fact the fact that you do have this fantastic toolkit to go in and build, you know, content types and menus and whatever, you, and you can sort of put together your site however you like. Um, that's always been one of the real strengths of Drupal, and it was I think you know probably it's probably still the the market later in terms of CMSs, in terms of what you can do in content modeling, at least within the UI, but that does that does run the risk that, or it, you know, what that means is that every Drupal site in the real world ends up looking completely different. Um, so you have a thousand kind of unicorn sites mm -hmm. instead of, um, instead of, you know, WordPress sites all, all look pretty much the same because WordPress has, is very opinionated about how you should structure your site. So I think, um, you know, I think what Eddie's been saying about trying to introduce consistency, whether that's through a distribution um, or just through developing some sort of community conventions around this kind of stuff is, is, is I think, a really important thing for Drupal to, mm. um, to, to sort of take forward because certainly what we see when we when we go into Drupal sites that have been built years ago mm. is that all the good intentions about content modelling, how the content model is supposed to work, um, have often just been left by the wayside because new people have come into the organisation, mm. there's no documentation, nobody really understands what any of this was actually set up to do. Um, yeah. So yeah. Use, use your um, YAML files, you know, once you've created it once, it's in Drupal 8, now it's exportable. That was harder back in the day. So um, yeah. use, use those approaches to make things consistent and write documentation once, not 30 times. Yeah. Just to follow on from that, I think it's really important to consider governance as well. So who gets to make the decision? Um, if someone wants to do some random um, new content type. So, yeah, um, we need we need the governance, and the, but then the governance itself needs to be a living document. So what structures are we going to put in place to, you know, to maintain that? Uh, and there's, there's a, a ton of great stuff um, on this. Um, I think it's Lisa Welchman, Managing Chaos, um, Digital Governance by Design, um, something like that hit me up if you need the details but that's a really good book on overall digital governance 
Uh, there's also a, a interesting comment here from Max. Yeah, I'm interested in how much awareness UX pros have in the accessibility requirements regarding content structure. Eddie, do you want to elaborate or answer that one? Yeah, I've been involved with the WCAG um, and audit, um, auditing groups here in New Zealand. Um, there's a lot to be done. Um, it is an education, um, just like all this stuff we're talking about writing plain English. Um, accessibility requirements are interpretive. Um, there's, there is some hard and fast rules, but yeah, there's some really great, um, if you look at the DQ who makes X testing, the web aim stuff, there's some good posters that DQ make, which are sort of nice visual um, diagrams, which you can give to your designer or to give to the, um, the client early on. Um, and there, there's some really good steps that go through, you know, have you considered if you're doing a pop-up modal, what are the questions? Um, you know, this sort of stuff too, you know, but if it's, you, you want it to work, you want to think wider. So um, the sooner you can get those in front of your client um, and your design team, the better. And, and it's, you know, accessibility by design, not, not by putting on at the end of the review. And for, for content authors, the uh, the new DTA or the new Australian Government Style Manual is a really good resource um, because it's been written with accessibility in mind, kind of from the ground up. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, some of the, the playbooks for the US as well, um, and these sorts of things of looking at component-based um, front-end design. Um, you know, the Government UK have got one too. I think everyone's got a flavour. We've, we've poached some of theirs and some of Australians, I think, so. Use, use what people have done before that's working and tested. Um, this is a slightly random question, but what is your opinion on pop-ups in 2020? <laughs> <laughs> what did the evidence tell you would be my short answer. I've never done, I've never done a user test where users have said, oh, that pop-up's great, I love it. It's, it's um, usually so. when do they hate it least? Uh, yeah. I guess my I'm curious, like where because people clearly want pop ups, otherwise they wouldn't exist. So where is that um, coming from? Like who's who's saying pop ups are great and we should do that? And how could we as um, UX and content experts uh, tell them, well, you should look at other ways of let it, less invasive ways of doing that? I think it's marketing. Uh, in one way. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming from marketing. Yeah, it's the conflict between business needs, sell shit, and user needs, get shit done. Cool. Um, and there's also a question here, I, I think it was partly answered. Um, do you know of a tool that reads pages and gives rankings based on optimum predefined structures? Well, you should probably just start looking at the, the heading structures that probably, I'm not sure exactly what that person means, but um, start with the heading structures, they're the sort of accessibility go-to point. Um, but content modelling and, and on-screen modelling is really important to quantify each of those steps. I don't know if anyone else wants to add something. I'm not sure whether the, question, uh, whether the person's talking about things like readability, but there are definitely tools that can assess that and give you a score on you know um, things like the reading level of, of text and um, the only thing is I'd, I'd take those automated tools with, yeah, with a grain of salt because the um, the algorithms are actually not that sophisticated yeah. and um, mm. the human eye is always, always going to be a better yeah you know, a better test I'm, I'm wondering if um, so just following up from, from what Angus was saying um, visible thread and readable are two good tools you can use to do those audits but I agree totally with Angus there a bit they have their place, but they're not that that insightful um, always. I'm also wondering if some SEO audit tools might give you some sense of how well the site um, is structured, um, but, yeah, I probably need to think more about that one. Yeah. I mean, the Lighthouse tool and, and the Chrome Developer is a starting point, but depends what you're looking at. As all these things, any automated tool is not going to see things as a human sees things. So you've got to really – accessibility, usability, any other sort of stuff – Color contrast. Cool. I think we're out of time. Does anyone have any closing comments that they want to add? Yep. Thank I think you. all the questions were answered. Thank you so much. Um, I actually wish we had longer to talk about this, but um, maybe there'll be a, a version two at some point in the future. So I want to thank you all for being part of the panel and thanks to all the questions that have come through as well. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks.